Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. I'm Gary Pollan. And I'm Dallas Jones. This week on Red, White, and Blue, we're going to be talking about Houston urban affairs. And it's not the kind of affairs you're thinking about, though that might be more of interest to you. But this is actually about our city and where we're going. And we have three great guests. First, Vanessa Sampson, who is the executive director of the Fourth Ward Redevelopment Authority. Secondly, Algenita Scott Davis, who's program manager for Center for Civic and Public Policy Improvement, and that's a mouthful. And William Fulton, who's director of the Kinder Institute for Urban Research. Three great guests. Absolutely. So let's jump right into it. Okay. Let's talk, um, uh, we're calling it urban affairs, but uh, uh, really we're, we're focusing in on this idea of gentrification, um, which some people call it, uh, others do not. Um, and, I, and I would direct my first question to you, Mr. Fulton. Um, the Kinder Institute has done a study mm -hmm. um, about gentrification and its effect on our city and, and where we're going. Could you give us a little bit of what your study yeah, well, what we Details. studied, what gentrification is really uh, an, an increase in the value of real estate and other activities in a neighborhood that 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 does not necessarily benefit the people who live there. Uh, as we've seen throughout the country and 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 uh, in the Fourth Ward, among other places, uh, we've seen a lot of that in Houston. Uh, our study found that that pretty much. On the west side of the loop, uh, west side of Main Street, uh, the whole that whole area has been gentrified, and then the east side of Main Street, where we are now, that's all going to become gentrified. The question is not whether or not there is more investment and more gentrification. The question is what happens to the people and the businesses who already live there. Will they be displaced? And in many cases, they are. Uh, but in many cases, there are ways to try to help those folks stay in place and prosper even uh, as uh, the neighborhood around them changes. Well, uh, fourth word redevelopment. This kind of fits right into your area. One of one of the things that when when I look at this issue, my concern is well, the good news is if you own your home, the value goes up. But the bad news is the value of your home goes up, your property taxes go up, and you may reach a point where you can't afford to hold on to your home and you're forced to sell. So, are there problems for the existing residents? that take place because of this development going on? Certainly there are problems because we have a lot of, uh, of the population who have fixed incomes and they are historical residents who family lineage goes back for decades and when you're talking about displacing someone who's on a fixed income, you have issues with transportation, with accessibility to health care, uh, all the things that they've grown accustomed to. And what I find in gentrification, how I couch it, is that there was an era of what we considered was white flight, when whites left the urban center and there was a, uh, a leaving of a, of a community there that was not uh, serviced well. And now economic privilege gives people an opportunity to come back and displace them again. And that's the unfairness that I see in it because we're trying to come up with solutions with how to keep people viable in their communities. And, you know, you have to think outside the box. Ms. Davis, uh, the Center for Civic and Public <laughs> Policy Improvement. Talk about your work in this area. The center itself has um, a mission to cover four areas, health, education, criminal justice, and housing. So housing, of course, is our big, big focus. And gentrification, of course, is one of our areas that we think we really, really must do something about. The center is working right now to stimulate affordable housing in the southeast area. And they're doing so by identifying properties that are available for uh, developers, both public and private, and encouraging the use of those properties that are owned by the Midtown Redevelopment Authority that's dedicated those properties for affordable housing to identify those and work with developers to place affordable housing, whether it's multifamily or single family, on those properties. To date, uh, there have been over 300 units uh, constructed, multifamily units constructed on property that was purchased by the Midtown Redevelopment Authority. So the, it makes a difference when you can not have to pay for the land so the developer can then charge less money for rent. And they've also done over 100 houses in this southeast area where the, where the developer did not have to pay for the land 
at a normal market cost, but instead could just construct the house and move in people like police officers or teachers or individuals whose income that the 60, 80, 90 percent of the area median income for Houston. So that means that people who would not be able to live centrally and comfortably nearby the services to which they are accustomed could do so. Uh, my question uh, for, for Mr. Fulton would be this, uh, and for the others, does our tax system make things more difficult for uh, existing homeowners or residents of an area that's now being redeveloped because of the, uh, the flight of the, who, the people with money back into the inner city where they ran from 30 years <laughs> ago? Yeah, or yeah, whatever you want to call it. People with ago. money. Okay, right. Years, seven right. years ago. Well, the, the, uh, <laughs> The property tax system certainly does. Texas has no income tax, but all over Texas we have high property taxes compared to other states. Uh, and of course, t property taxes go up as property value goes up, property value goes up as people pay more money for the property. So the answer to that is obviously yes. And that affects not only homeowners uh, who have to pay the property tax, but especially renters uh, whose homes can be destroyed or replaced uh, and, and, and either the price goes way, the rent goes way up or or they get or, or they get evicted because somebody's going to build something new. Al Janine is quite right, though, that the key here, I think, is land price. Yes. In in these urban neighborhoods, it's when the price of land that goes way up that the price of everything goes up. And if you can find ways, um, uh, for example, by using. Uh, uh, a land bank or or a, a government agency government such as agency mid, such as Midtown right. mm -hmm. or even or even in the third ward much of the lands owned by churches uh, that are interested in in redeveloping if you can uh, if you can find a way to eat the land costs and keep keep the, the that price down the cost of construction is what it is and then the overall cost to the homeowners or the renters won't go up as much right and our system this. yes our system the Harris County appraisal district they're going to focus on land cost that is their big big focus if you want to if you want to go down and appeal your your our taxes that appeal the valuation, the first thing they're going to do is say, all right, the improvement may not be going up in cost, but the land mm -hmm. is going up in cost because we are Houston. And that's something that Houston has that other, other places don't have. They have that land and the, 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 the quantity of land. So what happens is that the land price continues to go up. The taxes are going up based on the land price, not necessarily because of the improvement, but those taxes are going to increase. And it doesn't matter really what sitting on the land because the focus for the district is to make sure that the, the taxes are increasing based on the land price because that square footage uh, comparative cost, a comparative value is what the appraisal district is going to use. I do have a follow up and, and this, is, this is really particularly for our, our viewers. So we can build, we can give land, construction costs, affordable housing, you know, which for many, they would say, well, even affordable housing is not that affordable, right? <laughs> and for people yeah. that meet 60 to 80% of median income of, of many of these neighborhoods, which don't have a high median income, there's still the, the challenge of access to capital, particularly for those that over life have reached uh, uh, that threshold, but perhaps may have had some challenges in the past, right? What resources are available for our viewers to understand how they can achieve this dream of home ownership and particularly with the work that you all are doing? Yeah, home ownership is extremely important and it is where the, the low income family accumulates most of its wealth when it comes to home ownership. So it quite often is the dream. It stabilizes the family and keeps the student from moving from school to school because there is home ownership. So what's available is going to be only what comes from those private sources. There, there, there's not like a public lending entity that's going to charge less interest than the private sources and the private banks. So there are the incentives that are available through tax credits, through our efforts with as a result of Harvey, and there are these that will um, put a lot more public dollars into the housing price, into actually doing the housing. But when it comes to borrowing money, that's that's going to be the real challenge, and it will continue to be the challenge for the person who is a low to moderate income individual. Once someone owns the home, 
doesn't the market take over in terms of what the yes. land value tax wise is? Right. So and you could actually live in Fourth Ward in a house that's a hundred years old yes. that needs a lot is would be some people would call a tear down. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if on the tax rolls the, the, the improvements are valued at zero. Yes. yes. And the and the and the land is rapidly increasing yes. as the development takes place around it, which everyone would say they want because development's good and mm -hmm. the government likes it because it brings in more tax revenue. It brings more restaurants and services, right? But then the problem is you're at and a fixed income, what do you do? Right, so that's where the creativity of how do you identify what is housing, uh, what does that mean now? And you have to start being a little bit more creative with how you are putting these things together. From our vantage point, I was the attorney for the uh, TERS before I became the administrator, and in 2004, we incorporated the Freedmen's Land Trust to, to try to do a community land trust. Uh, we had own, you know, very, maybe six lots at the time. And we approached the administration, of the city's administration at the time and said, let's just do a trial of doing this land trust type of thing where the value of the land is taken out and the, the, the structure on top is, is a movable structure that you can buy and sell and, and only appreciate as far as the improvements that you make. Because my, from my vantage point, when we're looking at affordability and you get someone in a house uh, of affordability, but it only lasts for so long and it goes to market. Once it goes to market, it would never be affordable again. So how do you recycle the same product over and over oh. again and then instead of pushing affordability outside of your, um, the access of what people need, you just make sure that when they sell again, they're selling to the same type of buyer and that becomes a, just a recycling thing. Because if you make the housing a certain way, it should be housing that they grow out of anyway. But, so then, I, but then you talked about having a home is a way to for right, somebody accumulate, wealth. Yes. accumulate wealth, but right. not if you're restricted. No, Which, by there's the way, no restrictions because at the, at the moment you build housing, let's say for instance, for a, someone that's coming out, a student that, mm -hmm. that has a lot of debt or whatever, you build what we're considering now, we're building the shotgun style house or whatever. Right. As that person becomes more viable in their, their uh, growing their, their jobs or have a family or whatever, they would grow out of that, that structure anyway. So housing doesn't mean that you go out and do a three, two type of house. It's just stability for where you are at that moment to where you keep someone economically incentivized to grow in their jobs in order to grow out and that product becomes, again, useful for someone well, the in the other same option situation. is what California did, Proposition 14, which basically the, the, the property tax value of a home is what you paid. And it doesn't, and it only and goes it up because of inflation. But that, but that uh, Prop 13, but that doesn't necessarily, <coughs> right, that doesn't necessarily, that, that helps, that rewards long-time home ownership, mm -hmm. not necessarily a fixed income, right? It does help people on fixed incomes, but it's not targeted to them. I think there are a bunch of other things that can be done. Uh, uh, um, obviously, any government action to to uh, reduce the property taxes for long-time homeowners uh, is something that, that has been done in different places, and, and uh, finding ways as you know, from the profits of the of the gentrifying neighborhood uh, to plow back into assisting longtime homeowners to pay their property taxes that's something that's been done in Atlanta and elsewhere so it really it's it's the property as you pointed out Gary for the homeowners the longtime homeowners it's really the property tax question the rest of it kind of takes care of itself what you said in your oh, I'm sorry go ahead Miss I was about to just say this this is where the habitat model comes in mm -hmm. because habitat is the bank your former director that's uh, the <laughs> years. And, and when you are the banker, then you can work with the homeowner mm -hmm. when it comes to those taxes and train your homeowner to definitely go out and protest the taxes, but also to ensure that that house is then, as if you are the, the person that, that has the right of first refusal as the banker, then you can control to whom that house is sold to make sure that the next home, the next homeowner qualified. is somebody who is qualified for yeah. an affordable housing. So there are things you can put restrictions on the property. You can put recapture of the cost of the land on the property. You can do a lot of things in addition to ba the land banks that would help reduce the cost and control that. The key is who's financing that property and who's going to be on top of it when it comes to that next sale that's going to happen. Right. I want to go back to your opening statement, and uh, I am, I am, and again, for our viewers, I am the king of simplification. I, I, <laughs> I'm not as smart as Gary. Um, That's so fast. <laughs> <laughs> 
what I took from your opening statement, and there, there was, I, and I can't remember exactly what you said, but what I took from it was, this isn't good. Well, I don't think it's necessary. Well, you want investment <laughs> in neighborhoods. I mean, uh, uh, gentrification that displaces longtime residents and 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 longtime businesses that's not good you do that want in, you do want investment in neighborhoods right what we're talking about what Vanessa was talking about is is the issue of neighborhoods that have been ignored for a long time and don't have the things they need so I so want to cross apply that to her work yeah. right where you look at Friedman's town its history mm -hmm. right based on what you're saying how does it apply to this particular area of our city that has such a history mm -hmm. Well, I think it, I think in Friedmanstown and Fourth Ward, uh, the, the the mistake was made of ignoring too much of the history. Yes. Right. Uh, 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 clearly, that that in many ways that community has benefited tremendously from from investment. That's brought in new residents. It's brought in new businesses. Uh, but that's overwhelmed the longtime residents and 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 the character of the neighborhood. The same is true, you know, all throughout all throughout Midtown. Uh, <clears throat> the, so the question is, how do you bring that investment in? How do you bring new residents in that will help the neighborhood? And how do you do that without displacing or overwhelming the longtime residents and the longtime businesses? And what's interesting, and I, I, I will say, um, in the spirit of disclosure, which I'm always in, you know, I, <laughs> I, I do sit on the board of, of the Fort Worth Redevelopment Authority, and it's been an interesting um, perspective. Um, from the longtime residents mm -hmm. versus the newer residents, and it, it's it's been some conflict there. It's been conflict there because I believe that, um, and and I say this all the time. My one of my pet projects is the Bethel Church because it mm -hmm. symbolizes yes. to me the history and the newness. So it, it and I tell people and the all the time, out for it the doesn't newness. matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter what we build over there if people do not buy into the fact that they're in the same community. Right. If the new residents don't come in with the idea that you are coming into a historic area and you appreciate what you've come into. If the historical residents don't appreciate that people can appreciate your history and not destroy it, it, it becomes a community where everybody can be proud of because it's not only Freedman's Town story, it's the story of Houston, it's the story of mm -hmm. Texas, it's a United uh. States story, it's a world yeah. story that we, we owe it to them to be able to retell that story. And Mary, that's, that's why I particularly, you know, get, I, I particularly thought it was important that Vanessa be here just because mm -hmm. we can pick a lot of neighborhoods where this is happening, yes. but basically this, this yes. neighborhood yes. has a very yes. interesting story to it. So I'm I, sorry, Ms. Davis. I was going to ask, so how, how, are, how are this that going? Because if you look at Houston, and you go back into Houston's history, mm -hmm. Houston has basically been run by real estate interests forever. Yes. And it's not much for history. Houston no. is Get not. Get rid of it. Well, and, and tell the story. That's the real. To, tell, to tell the story that, that came to me, I was approached by Houston Chronicle. They called me and asked me specifically was, did I believe that uh, it was too late for Fourth Ward uh, for our history, historical preservation. And I told the young lady, I forgot her name, but I told her I was offended. And the reason why I was offended because the people who were at the table when I-45 came into play should have been considering history of the Fourth Ward area and right. the contributions of that, of that city or whatever because that was the, the impetus that destroyed what was once a robust community. And when you're talking about people who have been, and I, I am a firm believer that everybody is important. You know, if Bill Gates' son wants a Happy Meal, <laughs> the person who is doing the fries is important. Everybody is important. The, the garbage person is important because for those who t take it under, under you know, uh, some type of thing, privilege that my gar garbage is just supposed to be picked up, what happens in Harvey? You know, when we are, when Maryland or, or wh wherever, you have garbage and mold and everything everywhere. So they become very important. When you don't, find or, or recirculate the importance of people, people feel like they're, they're not being heard. And when you're not heard, you feel like you're just thrown away or whatever. And that community deserves way more than what this, this city has given it. You know, there's a couple of things. There is this, <laughs> and a, a, the Kinder um, Associate Director, Dr. Kyle Shelton, has done a great book. It's called Power Moves. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the impact of the interstate mm -hmm. system mm -hmm 
uh, transportation, what it has done to inner city neighborhoods like the Fourth Ward, ward and, and we say in Fifth Ward that the interstate system crucified Fifth Ward. They put 59 here and I-10 mm -hmm. there. So that's <laughs> it totally destroyed Fifth Ward. So they, there, there's more to it in terms of what impacts and what creates the lack of services in these communities, not just coming from the city, but also coming from the federal government. Yes. And in terms of destruction of the history, and especially in a city where if you have something declared historical other than a district, in 90 days you can just tear it down. Other so we the just astronaut. don't. <laughs> well, <laughs> whether you voted on that, so that's a different yeah, I story. Get rid of it. <laughs> but when you get rid of the Astrodome, then what becomes, I mean, when we go to New York or other places, whatever, you go there for the historical right. structure. Mm -hmm. So if we destroy everything that we feel that are relics well, no, but, or whatever. But, but and they put a sign in, in New York to keep yeah. that. Well, that's what we're going to do with that's what we're going to do But the Astrodome was the first <laughs> dome exactly. stadium ever built. Yeah. So, you know, we have to find value. Houston has to find value in things that over time <laughs> is going to make people, and I ask people, what do you come here, Galleria? You know what, and, and this is petty, but I, I'm an Astroworld baby, you know, yeah, and I still Astroworld. can't figure out why they got rid of Astroworld. Now all of a sudden we're trying to bring a theme park back to Houston. It's like, why did we get rid of the one we had? It supported the historical the structure. Still vacant. Right. And the land's still vacant. Doesn't, doesn't yes. that rodeo own it or somebody? No, no, like, why did we do this? Parking <laughs> for three weeks a yes, year. The that power. is crazy. But, but I do power. Think but no, I think money. That, it's always about I the money. I think Vanessa makes a b good point. So you, yes, so you, uh, in the interest of your full disclosure, when I first moved to Houston five years ago, I lived in a brand new apartment building right across the street from Bethel Church. Yes. And and um, I think a lot of we can talk a lot about government policy and subsidies and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think a lot of it is, as Vanessa says, it, it's about individual attitudes. Mm -hmm. yes. So I moved to Houston. I've never lived here before. I live across the street from this historic African. American uh, landmark. Uh, I don't know what it is. Nobody told me. Um, I just started going over there and looking at it. And w if you walk through there and you look at the old photographs, right. it's an ex immensely powerful experience yes. that makes you feel connected to the place where you're living. So and I think. So I think it's not just all the government policies. It's the attitudes of the new folks who come in me, about the older neighborhood. Let me comment on on what you just said about reading those panels. Those panels were not uh, initially thought to be in there. Yeah. Right. Because there was this this big uh, push to tear the walls down. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. at the time, me being an executive director, I wasn't sure I had the vote to vote <laughs> to build the, the thing in place. So I held on to that for a while. By the time I made the presentation to my board, and this was before Dallas was on the on the board, I believe, or you had just gotten on, I remember I said, we have two options. Either we're going to build the whole thing in its entirety, mm -hmm. as it's designed, mm -hmm. or we tear the walls down. Mm -hmm. And the middle part I took away. But my argument was, once we start losing our historical structures, yes. we have to be able to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And yes. if you don't have the walls, you cannot put no, the, the panels up there. The, right. So I actually... That was my argument. It wasn't considered, but we got the panels up. But that was the, the ability to retell the story. And it was really from the basis of, from my point of view, what the church was always a centering point of black, uh, mm -hmm. black culture, black from civil rights to women's rights, from whatever the case may be, from yeah. slavery. Mm -hmm. It was grounded in the church. Yes. And that's why Bethel was so important yes. because it tells a story, even upward to President Barack Obama, how mm -hmm. significant the church played a part in mm -hmm. keeping a community as a community. And whether it's economic prowess, whatever it was, it, it originated yeah. from the church. And that was my argument with keeping yeah. the, it, the, the walls of the, the, the structure there and to me, that is just the ground and so, part of that. So, are community. we not? Uh, is it, are we not doing a good enough job of explaining, especially to the new residents who have moved into the neighborhood, uh, the historical significance of the fourth ward to everybody? Because yes. that story, the third yes. you know, read it from the third yes. ward. Yes. All of them. Well, that's <laughs> one of the, right now, Absolutely. they're working on a conservancy to to do a fourth ward conservancy. Over there is very infantile right now. But that's something that eventually we will be uh, in discussions. My board would be in discussions with the conservancy on how do you tell that story. Uh, we try to get a UNESCO designation right. and looking at the slave pattern from uh, Galveston, Galveston to mm -hmm. up through right, Emancipation right. Park and right. and the the pastors who founded Bethel Leverett actually bought the land for Emancipation Park. So we're all interconnected, and it's just a matter of 
how do we tell the story to be of significance to where new people come in and you buy into the, mm -hmm. the area that right. you buy into? So and are you that, finding, are y'all finding that the political leadership and the economic leadership in the city is supportive of uh, enhancing the historical importance of, of Real quick, third, fourth, we're and fifth wars. Right. I, I don't. I don't see it. We don't. We are not promoting Houston as the the history and the cultural icon that it really is. We failed to do that as a city, and we wow. should do that. We should do that. Houston first should do it. Houston first should be talking about our different destinations that we have that are important. You go to other cities and they brag about their history. Yeah, they'll, they'll you come like to a Houston walking tour. You can go see you know, all these. We start yeah, talking yeah, about you know cowboys and boots. We got to figure yes. out how we talk about our culture and our background and way, what made Houston the economic engine that it was. And that's because of the different cultures that were in Houston and the different communities that were work solidly to build this city into what Ego it is. is the same. Real Ego quick, is the same. real quick, yes. real quick. Why should we care about this? We should care about this because it's important to our city, it's important to our brand, it's important to our communities, and if we tell our communities, our inner city communities, this is important, you're important, you, you should be happy to be there, and we protect those residents that are our traditional residents, and it makes a big difference. We cannot claim to be the most diverse city if we're not really going to be diverse, and that and is the last everybody. word. And, 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 and you got to make sure that new investment in neighborhoods lifts everybody. That's yes. it. Thank you all for being <laughs> here. <laughs> you all have been an amazing guest. This is Red, White, and Blue. We look forward to seeing you next week. I'm Dallas Jones. I'm Gary Paul, and we'll see you next week.